My name is Mikko, Mikko Linen. I work for, for, work for Intel and um, I've been working on uh, confidential computing and various uh, cloud native uh, technologies for, for the past few, few years. And uh, in the uh, intersection of those two, I've been working on a project called Confidential Containers that's uh, part of the, the CNCF Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, Ravi gave a good in introduction to, to confidential com computing already. And uh, there was a good question uh, about how many of uh, you in the audience know about confidential co computing. Uh, my, my observation has been that not too, not too many people raise their hands when this, this question is, uh, when, this gets, when this question gets, gets asked. Uh, it was good to see so many, uh, so many hands uh, raised up. Uh, I would like to uh, ask a follow-up question to that is that how many of you have actually started to adopt confidential computing in, in your da daily work? Not, not too many, not too many. That's good because uh, uh, part of my talk is what I'm gonna, what I'm trying to uh, achieve here is that uh, okay? How do we how do we make this uh, confidential computing adoption easy for the applications that exist today? I've been I've been hearing a lot of these. Uh, uh, comments and I've been participating uh, uh, quite a few discussions uh, whether we would need to have uh, dedicated uh, user space or user library APIs for the workloads to take advantage of uh, co confidential computing. And my observation just recently was that hey, maybe we don't actually need to do that. We have uh, pretty compelling existing APIs uh, provided uh, by, by the kernel uh, that we could maybe um, take, take benefit of. Uh, and uh, that's basically what my, my talk is about. So uh, Linux keyring seems to provide the, the necessary functionality for at least certain uh, use cases that are kind of relevant for, for confidential computing as, as well. I had uh, initial offline conversations about this particular topic and I got some positive um, uh, positive signs that, hey, this could work, sounds okay, but of course it depends on, on the use case. So um, uh, I, I have a couple of use cases that I, I want to show, show you. This, my talk, by the way, I forgot to mention, this is um, in the short talk category where the idea is that I, I spend roughly 20 minutes or so talking about the actual topic and then we could have 10 minutes for, for discussion. Let, let's see how that works out I'm between you and, and, and the lunch. Uh, so uh, let's see how that uh, plays. But I, let's say I, I'm also available for the both session later on. I could maybe even give you a, like a live de demos about the setup that I'm, I'm talking about to today. So just, just let me know. Timing wise, fortunately, my agenda also includes very basic definition of, of confidential computing. Um, I'm, I'm able to skip some of those because they were covered uh, by Ravi in, in the previous talk. I hope I have some gaps to fill, especially in the, in the areas of like uh, at attestation and some of the, the details what goes into the attestation. I'm also going to, of course, give a high level overview of what this uh, Linux keyring functionality is about. I have two use cases covered that sort of uh, highlight or showcase the idea that uh, I've, been, I've been thinking. One is about uh, uh, disk encryption and then another one is about uh, like how workloads could seamlessly attest uh, to get uh, attestation tokens in, into the, the confidential en environments, TE environments. And uh, at the end, uh, summary, call to action and hopefully a bit of uh, discussion as well. Uh, I'm going to skip the basic definition of what this confidential computing is, is about. Uh, there were, were quite nice uh, um, examples uh, covered why, why this is needed very uh, commonly or 
where confidential computing is emerging these days of um, is like cloud en environment so it allows uh, workloads to move to clouds without worrying about like uh, your friendly csp tampering your your data confidential computing builds on top of the the tees attestability is really the key so that you actually get to verify remotely remote attestation in particular remotely the the states of your tee before you get to to in, in inject your secrets or before you get to provision your secrets into the runtime environment of course uh, tcp is uh, an, an, an important aspect uh, as well um, a, a vulnerability in, in your TCP, inside your TCP, may break the security of, of, your, of your system. That's why the goal should be that design for, for a small TCP to uh, make the likelihood of bugs getting in your TCP uh, slightly smaller. If you look at uh, like uh, concrete uh, examples, how this confidential computing um, shows up in in, in data centers uh, today and what, what it actually means if you do not have con confidential computing. So elements with potential access to your confidential data without confidential computing, your whole platform is basically your, your TCP and uh, your, even your host admin, uh, host operating system can potentially get to see your, your confidential, confidential data, whether it's running on the host or in, in a confidential virtual machine. There are TEE technologies that uh, allow you to isolate the TEE to a very small um, size enclave. Um, it could be even like a, a library level TEE that uh, uh, you have like a very small TCP uh, and then Outside your, your TEE, you have uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, components. What, what's the focus of my talk today is when you are adding um, a VM isolation, confidential VM I I isolation to, 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 the, to the mix. Uh, in, uh, with, with confidential VMs, you basically, what's outside your TCP is all your platform owners, uh, uh, BIOS firmware and, and also the host, op uh, host uh, operating system and, and, and the VMM hyper hypervisor. And uh, you get to control what goes in, into your TCP by defining what, what is, in, what is in, in your VM guest, guest operating system and uh, the application data in it. Um, a bit more about at attestation. So um, there is a group um, under the IETF uh, working on defining various aspects uh, of, uh, of remote, remote attestation. The, the working group is called uh, the, the RATS architecture or the RATS, RATS stream remote attestation procedures. Um, I'm using some of their material just to define the terminology that I, I have um, in, in, in my use cases la later on. What's really um, relevant here is like what is the attester role uh, in, in, in the picture. So attester is uh, in, in this case the, the confidential VM or the application running in inside the, the confidential VM. The attester produces uh, evidence for the verifier, someone who checks that, hey, okay, the, if, uh, if, if the, the TEE environment is what it, it's expected to be. The verifier uses various sources of, of information to actually make sure or check ag against whether, whether, the, whether the TEE environment is uh, is a legit uh, environment. Um, the verifier can produce attestation results and then some relying party can um, uh, use the attestation re results to, to, to make the final statement that, hey, okay, uh, the attester that originally produces the, the, the claim was in, indeed a, a legit uh, TEE environment. 
Uh, in addition to these roles, oops, what's uh, wrong with the... Sorry about that. Um, in addition to these roles, there are different type of topologies how this att attestation takes place. Uh, two of the most commonly used uh, topologies is the, the background check mode, and then another one is the, the passport mode. There are, of course, like hybrid variations of, of these two, but uh, these are the most uh, commonly used and uh, something that I'm, I'm using with, with my use cases later on. So uh, let's uh, take a closer look of, of the, the topologies. Uh, uh, in, in the background check mode, the flow works in a way that the attester produces the evidence from the DE and uh, sends the, 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 the evidence to a relying party. This relying party could be an application who, for example, uh, keeps secrets. It could be like a HSM key broker service uh, who needs to verify or make sure that uh, the attester or the application running in a TEE who wants to get some secrets provisioned is indeed a legit TEE environment. But the relying party application itself doesn't know what to do with the quote or what to do with the evidence. So the relying party can then uh, um, send the attestation uh, request to the verifier to check uh, whether the evidence that was provided was, uh, was something that uh, should be trusted. And then the verifier checks uh, for the hardware evidence, and then it can provide the, uh, the attestation token back uh, to the relying party. And then the relying party can still do final checking and evaluate uh, the attestation results against some custom um, local policies uh, before, uh, before responding to the original request uh, from the attester. With, with the passport mode, um, it works uh, slightly different, so the attester um, talks to the verifier directly. Uh, it could include a, a nonce uh, from the verifier for the freshness purposes. Uh, the attester collects the, the evidence and, and, and sends the attestation request to the verifier. The verifier again checks the evidence, but uh, in this case, the verifier returns back an attestation token to the attester, and the attestation token is then what uh, the attester uses with some relying parties to, to say, hey, I have my passport, this has been verified by the, the, the verifier X, I need to get some services from the relying party application. Again, it could be like a key broker service. The, the relying party then checks for the token again and responds back with the uh, with the request. So that's, uh, that's about um, um, the, the confidential computing and at attestation side of things. Uh, let's move on to the keyring si side of the things and uh, talk a bit about uh, what this uh, Linux keyring mechanism is, is about and then, then I'm going to show you how the, the, two, the, the confidential computing and attestation can be combined with, uh, with the keyring, keyring functionality. Um, keyring is an internal um, functionality to store um, security-related data. It could be like the keys or, or, or tokens. I think the history is that it was originally um, implemented for, for the kernel components to, to, to store and, and, and use uh, secrets or security related materials, but uh, it is also possible for the applications to, to use the, the kernel, kernel mechanisms to, to, to store and, and retrieve uh, uh, key, key data in, inside the kernel. Uh, the keys uh, definition is that each key in the kernel has an ID, it has a, a description, some free text format of, of des description that uh, identifies the, the key. Oh, oh, of course, it has a, a type. There are different types. I'm going, going to those types uh, in, in a moment. Uh, payload is basically what, uh, what, uh, what the content of, of that, that key is. 
and then access control mechanisms, how, how long the key is, is valid and, and who, who is actually using the key for, for reference counting gives that information. Different types of keys, um, basic, basic types, uh, user, user key, uh, log, log on key, big key, big key is uh, just like a, a key with a, a, a bigger size in, 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 in the kernel storage. Um, and then key can also be a key ring and, and, and uh, key rings uh, are what the kernel uses to anchor uh, the, the life cycle and, and permissions for, for, for a, a key. There are different types of uh, uh, key rings in, in, in the kernel like process, what, what this key ring type of process allows you to define is that, uh, for example, certain process in, 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 the, uh, in, in, the, in the user space only has the access to a particular key that, is, uh, uh, that can be found for, uh, for, 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 the, for the key ring. Or even in, in a way that it can go to the finer granularity that uh, uh, a, a thread in, 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 in the process, only one thread in, in, in the process can access a, a particular key. And there are also different uh, other, other types of uh, uh, key key rings like persistent or some special key key rings that are only reserved for the kernel uh, internal fu functions. What makes this uh, interesting, of course, the user's perspective and, and the application's perspective uh, um, is that there, there are system calls uh, available to, to, to manipulate, uh, manipulate these keys. So the, the user land can uh, ha use the, the syscall add key to add key. Key control syscall allows you to manipulate certain key, key parameters like who has the access to a particular key how the key rings are linked to each other, how the keys are linked to various key rings and, and, and so on. And then finally there's a request uh, key uh, system call, which I found is pretty interesting for, for this uh, use case that I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. So a, a user uh, can, with this request uh, key, uh, system call, they, they can request uh, keys from the key net, kernel, kernel key store. Um, here I have the um, key utils uh, wrapper. This is, this is, this is how, how it looks. So when, when, when the application wants to access a, a key in, in, in the kernel key store, um, it just specifies what type of key the application is looking for what's the what's the, the description of, of the key. The, the caller can also specify like additional call out information uh, to, to specify or to, to bypass additional information and then uh, the destination key ring what uh, what is uh, uh, the, the key ring where this uh, application wants to have the, the key. Um, available. Um, what's, uh, so, and how, how, how kernel works when, when it gets this uh, request key co command, if it of course tries to find the key with the, with the requested uh, parameters and if, if it's not available, if it cannot be found, it just returns like an error code that uh, I have no key for it. Or alternatively, if the key is uh, available in the key store, uh, it can it 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 returns the the key ID that the application then can use to do what whatever it wants to do with that particular key ID. Uh, user can affect how the key um, is. Um, so there's a, there's a additional use case uh, with, with uh, or there's additional functionality with this request key functionality is that uh, if the user has specified uh, this call out information that is not as, as, as null and the kernel cannot find the key, the kernel has a mechanism that it actually can 
call out to the user space using this uh, request uh, key uh, helper trying to, to find um, someone in, in the user space that can actually instantiate the key. And uh, it, it's more like a, it's like a plugin me mechanism that uh, the, 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 the VM owners, in, in this case the v VM owners can, can specify um, configuration like where to find, where to try to find those keys. Um, it, it can be, uh, uh, there can be a, a, a plugin uh, provided by the VM owner that, hey, actually, this particular key can be found from a remote uh, HSM or, or, or a key, key broker service, for, for example, or some, some other use case uh, specific mechanism. And how this, how this works? Um, like a, on, a, on a very high level, um, to put it in, in a sequence di diagram, so we have the key I ID user um, calling the, the request key, the kernel tries to find the key that was requested by, by the key ring user, cannot find it, um, uh, the kernel issues the call out to the user space, and, and then in case of confidential container, uh, co co confidential com computing, now we are getting into the kind of the beef of, of my, my talk here. So what we can do uh, to hide some of the att attestation details from the application who, who was using uh, the, the, the keyring fu functionality is that we can have a, um, a, a, an attestation aware up call provider uh, that knows, first of all, how to generate the, the hardware evidence from the TEE and environment and then uh, reach out, reach out to, to, to some relying party or some, some verifier to, to get uh, some, some secrets provisioned in, into the kernel. Here I'm using uh, the confidential containers projects. Uh, there's, we have a simple key broker service client that is at attestation aware and this key broker service client knows how to talk to a, a key broker a key broker service with, with the attestation handshake happening happening between the two. Um, and the KPS client in, in this case has all the various hardware TEE uh, uh, has all the hardware TEE fun functions added, so the KBS client knows how to, to generate the, the, the hardware TEE specific e evidence on, on the platform that it is running. Uh, the KBS client issues uh, uh, an attestation, or let's say it could, could, it could be like a get me a secret type of uh, call to the, um, the key broker service and the attestation happens, um, attestation verification happens, evidence verification happens, and then if everything works fine, then the key broker service returns the, the key, key back and, and then the um, up call provider then in instantiates the, the key into the kernel. But the really um, from the application adoption perspective, uh, like I said, the application only needs to know about the key ring sys uh, request key, uh, syscall, and then everything else, including the attestation, is uh, abstracted behind the, the, the key, run, key, key ring functionality. And then let's take a look of uh, two, two different use cases. So one, one use case I have with, uh, with, with the crypt setup. Uh, and uh, encrypted uh, disk uh, passphrase retrieval from, uh, from a remote uh, key broker service uh, with, with, with attestation. So first of all, why we need or why it's important to have your uh, virtual disks uh, uh, encrypted. So if we, look, uh, if we go back to the, um, the, the trust model again, some of the, the elements of 
how the virtual disk data gets committed to the, the, the host goes through un untrusted pieces. So it is the responsibility for the VM itself or the application to make sure that uh, you have your data encrypted before it, get, it, 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 it gets uh, stored on the, uh, on, on the disk on, on the host side. So we need uh, disk en encryption for confidential vir virtual machines uh, in, 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 quite many, in, in quite many cases. Crypt setup tool, many of you are probably familiar with, uh, with the crypt setup tool to, to play with the looks, uh, looks functionality and already knows how to read uh, key slot uh, passphrases from the kernel key ring. Unfortunately, it doesn't, as of today, uh, use this non-null Call out, uh, call out information which would basically transparently allow uh, crypt setup uh, to be hooked in, into these uh, up call pro providers. But it can be worked uh, around in a manual way. So uh, I have a, a bit of a bash uh, uh, commands here first uh, showing that, hey, okay, we have no key keys in, 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 in the user, in the root user's default session, session key ring, but uh, using the key control utility and with the, with the proper configuration, uh, I can use key CTL requests, uh, test passphrase, and then behind the scenes, um, uh, the, the configuration of, of, the, of, of this particular VM that I was, I was using uh, fetches the pass, test passphrase from a remote uh, key broker service uh, uh, with, with attestation. And this, this uh, uh, setup here basically follows the background uh, check uh, at attestation topology where the crypt setup uh, application and, and the key, 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 broker client, key, key broker service uh, client talks to a, a remote uh, relying party key broker service and, and then key broker service uh, uses a, a verifier to check the, the hardware evidence and then only if everything passes, the test passphrase gets provisioned in, into the key ring. I've, I've done a bit of uh, my, my own ex experiments with, with this functionality that if I'm changing the crypt setup a little bit uh, to, to have a, a non-null call out information in, in the code, this actually works in, in a way that, hey, we don't have to do this uh, special custom key CTL request uh, command anymore, but the crypt, crypt setup it itself uh, can be just issued. Crypt setup open uh, and, and uh, once that uh, crypt setup command is issued, uh, the kernel key ring and, and the, the user space callout uh, gets the test uh, passphrase in, into the key ring uh, transparently behind the scenes and, and then it's just possible to, to get the, get the encrypted volume mounted. Uh, another potential use case for, for this one is uh, following the passport mode uh, where the application needs to get uh, uh, an attestation token generated. But in, in, a, in a way that uh, the application itself doesn't know what format or what, what is the right format or how to compose the right uh, attestation to token format or whatever is the, the verifier configuration even. So the, uh, it, it could be that uh, you have two different virtual machine builds. One is configured to use one verifier um, another one is configured to use some other verifier, so this is uh, something that the application doesn't need to know, know about. Um, and also, like, 
the application doesn't necessarily have to know about uh, how, how long the attestation token is valid. So typically, the verifier sets the token to expire after 30 minutes, 15 minutes or, or so. So the application doesn't have to have the, the logic of, okay, I need to get to request a, a new token yeah, after, after 15 minutes. This is all the, this is uh, everything what the keyring can actually offer. It can cash the token as long as it's, it's valid. Uh, and then if the application requests a, a, a new token, if the kernel has detected that, hey, this token has been expired, let's get a new one with the, with the, with the TCP status re-evaluated re, re uh, after, after that time period. Um, and then here I just have a simple a a example how, how this works. So the, again, using the confidential containers uh, functionality. So the, the Coco trustee setup uh, uh, knows to, to return JWT at the, at the station tokens back. So uh, the application is just requesting Coco, give me a Coco token and, and then in, in, in the key ring, it, it just gets the access to a, a JWT token that is issued uh, the COCO at the station service. And then, for example, that the TEE environment that this uh, test was run is, uh, is an uh, Intel TDX environment. Okay, so that pretty much concludes my, my, my talk and uh, everything that I, I wanted to cover so I was able to show you like how it's fairly easy to hide some of the attestation details from app applications hopefully in, in, in a way that it's, it's easy for the applications to start consuming confidential com computing in a way that it's like non, not uh, too intrusive that the applications would have to, to modify so applications based on this can just use the, the, the existing kernel, unmodified kernel keyring fu functionality to, to at least get the, some of the basics, basics uh, covered. All of my um, code setup and, and everything you can uh, find uh, from this uh, GitHub uh, gist that I, I made uh, available. But now uh, it's time, time for questions and I'm um, looking forward to, to hear feedback uh, from, the, from the audience if this made, made any, any sense or if you can think of any uh, additional use cases that would be interesting to, to explore. I have one, one more that kind of links to the, the supply chain topic. So uh, I this is something that I didn't originally include into my, my presentation as, as, as the use cases, but just Friday last week I was exploring how the asymmetric keys functionality can, can play with, with this setup. And that also seems, seems to work. So it is possible to use the keyring functionality to store uh, asymmetric keys and what's nice about this uh, asymmetric key keys setup is that uh, you can do for example code signing with the private key completely in, in the kernel and in a way that even the application doesn't have the access to the, to the private key side of things so it can only use the keyring services to do code signing but won't have the access to the uh, won't have the access to the private key itself Good. No questions. I guess uh, just like I guessed, so it's it's the lunch time now, so Oh is there there's a question? Uh, 
No, um, I'm still in a very early exploration phase. One thing that I, by the way, forgot to mention about this, uh, uh, the benefits of, of this setup is that uh, it allows me to implement uh, all these uh, key providers and att attestation functionality using what we are using in, in the confidential containers, it's using memory safe languages and, and uh, Rust based setup. So if you have uh, an application, legacy application Python based, it could still be able to use uh, Rust-based setup to deal with all the attestation pieces. But no, yeah, no, just uh, uh, like I said uh, in the beginning of the talk, I'm just early exploring the, the use cases and I would be very interested in following uh, uh, in, a, in a both session perhaps if, if you have ideas how this could be taken further. Next question, uh, how do Make sure you are talking to the right key program if you are plugged in uh, asks for keys. Yeah, um, that's um, something that the VM owner needs to decide uh, and whether the configuration actually gets measured in, into your quote that hey, this is uh, this is um, the right that the VM was booted using the right uh, con configuration that was expected. Good.